everybody. Welcome to Gojo and Gola. Mike Gold Jr., Mike Gold Sr., Claudia Bellafato holding it down for us in the DraftKings studio out there in Boston. Uh, we had a great show for everybody. As always, make sure you download, subscribe, rate, review us today. Leave us a five-star rating. Check us out here live Monday through Friday from 8 to 10 a.m. Eastern on the DraftKings Network, wherever you can find it. Catch the best of Gojo and Golik from noon to 1 p.m. Eastern each and every day on the radio on VEASAN. Claudia, what do we got coming up this fine Monday for everybody? It was a busy weekend, so we're going to catch you up on all of it, starting with a new quarterback room in Pittsburgh. Justin Fields officially out of Chicago to join the Steelers with Kenny Pickett now in Philly. It's Fields and Russell Wilson in Pittsburgh. Goodbye to a legend. We'll talk the news of Aaron Donald hanging up the cleats and Irish dancing in March fashion. The guys catch up with Notre Dame women basketball head coach Neil Ivey. Let's start with hoops. Selection Sunday has come and gone. We have the field set for both men's and women's tournaments, starting with the men's. UConn, to no surprise, is the number one overall but they have an uphill battle, guys, which we'll talk about. Looking at the rest of the bracket, Houston, the number one seed in the South, North Carolina in the West, Purdue in the Midwest. Gojo, when you look at this, when you were watching Selection Sunday, anything that really stood out to you outside of that uphill battle for UConn? Well, I'll tell you what stood out to me right away. Having Selection Sunday go on on the Sunday of St. Patrick's Day, perfect confluence of events. Like, there are just certain things that work well and go hand in hand, and a bunch of people out already drinking and carrying on for the thing that they had scheduled on the calendar, which, by the way, Dad, I want to give you credit for as we sit in here this morning. The only one of us who actually wore green today and adhered to anything resembling the St. Patrick's Day protocol, Dad's not... It was always growing up, and I don't know if it was different for any of you guys, if you didn't wear green to school on St. Patrick's Day. You got pinched. That was the thing where for all of a sudden, assault was legal on St. Patrick's Day if you didn't wear green. So, Dad, congrats. You don't get pinched. <laughs> didn't even realize it. Never even was the thought process in my mind when I put this on. Getting dressed in the dark, something Wait, I did for blue. a couple of decades at ESPN. Yeah, this is not green either, Mike. There's no green in the shirt at all. <laughs> This is basically blue. It's not green. It looks green for me. Mike, it's okay. It's it's Monday, yeah, Mike. It's fine. It's okay. Yeah. Probably you <laughs> were probably drinking yesterday and it looks green to you. So, yeah, there was zero thought I, process. I, I, we I went was. out to breakfast with me and me and your mother and and Sydney and Ben. None of us wore green. Never even thought about it. Ne- never it never even crossed our mind. I can't even remember the last time I went out to St. Patrick's Day, mm. I remember way, way, way back when in Cleveland, my dad would drop me and my two brothers off down in the flats in Cleveland and basically drop us off so we had to cab at home. Back when there were no Ubers, it was an actual cab that you took all the time. And just so we wouldn't drive. And he would drop us off at like nine in the morning and then we'd have to find our way home <laughs> by the end of the day. But uh, man, that was decades and decades ago. I, I can't remember the last time I've gone out on St. Patrick's Day. So, Claudia, good eyes out of you. Mike, you want to check your vision. There's no green in this shirt at all. <laughs> I, I, I am blown away. I wish people, if you're not watching on DraftKings Network somewhere, someone help me out here at Gojo and Golik on Twitter if that shirt looks at all green if you're watching this right now. Maybe it is. I, a, lot, a lot of margaritas this weekend. Didn't quite go full dollarita this weekend here, but went definitely down the margarita path. And I'm clearly paying for it this Monday. Um, Claudia, you mentioned some of the other things that stuck that stuck out here. I-, I think this first day of March Madness bracket breakdown, obviously some people are going to snap and already go and fill out their brackets. Some people fill out a ton of them. My father obviously has been a proponent over the years yep. of filling out tons <clears throat> of different sheets of integrity instead of just the one, try and give himself a lot of bites at the apples. I'm usually one that likes to wait a couple of days, really digest all of this. I'm playing catch up on a lot of college basketball season, and so I'm trying to get all the tidbits and morsels I can from the analysts, but I think this first day is really the the holy holiday of complaining about snubs, and it's interesting, Dad, watching the like massage train of people yeah. getting upset at one another about what's going on here because you've got a team like Virginia that's going to be in the crosshairs of a lot of people wound up in that first four uh, get matchup coming in to this season, 
and they're getting looked at by everybody in the Big East. UConn leading the charge of complaining about the fact that this league that has three teams in the top seeding line only got three teams into the tournament at all, and everyone's looking at Virginia getting in over the likes of St. John's and what that means, Rick Pitino's bunch getting snubbed by them from this league that thought they deserved more, the Mountain West getting a whole bunch of teams in there. So this feels like the chief day for everybody to complain, Dad. I don't know how you've seen it over the years. If more people are hopeful looking towards their bracket, or if this is the day that we're allowed to be angry for a bit. Well, I, I think it is always the day you're angry first. And don't be angry for long because the tournament's going to go to 80 teams. So your team, that got snubbed, will get in when we go to 80 teams. So as Jay Williams said when he was on our show, it's going to happen. So then we'll, we'll be discussing the 81st, 82nd, and 83rd team, the first four out there that got snubbed. You're right about Virginia. Uh, there in the play-in with, oh gosh, remember Mike at our time at ESPN, we weren't allowed to call it the play-in game. You had to call it the first round. The first round. It's a play-in game, okay? It, it is a play-in game. Virginia's playing Colorado State, uh, Midwest region. The winner is the number 10 seed there uh, for that play-in game, which are two this week, and we have our own play-in that we're going to get to at some point here, have a little bit of fun. I'm with you. It's a snubs a little bit here, but for the most part, I'm with you. I I don't fill out my sheet right away, but I do fill out multiples. Now, we're going to have a contest that we're going to talk about with, and and most contests you go into where you got to put a sheet in, like what we're going to do, you get like one sheet. But there are some, I'll go in others, you know, where you can put in as many as you want. I have filled out as many as 20 bracket sheets at some point, because as I've said for years, you play to win the cash, you know, and that's what I was always trying to do. So I would fill out sheets, and boy, this year, I know a lot of people are leaning toward UConn to go back-to-back, but there's a few other choices out there. I've already seen some of the analysts out there. A lot of them have gone chalk. That's the issue. If you are filling out, if you got one chance, one shot at your opportunity, okay, (laughs) you got one shot, a lot of times I think you're going to go more chalk, and we know that that does rarely happens as far as how much chalk you're going to get, Claudia. So I think that's that's the biggest reason I like to pick more is because I can do some upsets. But when I just got to turn that one in, it is tough to lean against the chalk when you're kind of moving forward. Senior, can I convince you maybe to just bet more instead of filling out a million brackets? Especially at DraftKings. We have a boost right now. 64% on any college hoops bet. Let's talk about, though, the different markets. Because you said UConn is the chalk pick when it comes to brackets. But you can get them at 4-1, to plus 400. 100 wins you 400, $500 payout. That's a good bet. Championship. To reach Sweet 16, of course, you're going to be paying a little bit more. But Elite 8, you can get them at minus 160. The region winner, you can get them at plus 105, right? So if you are betting, you can get that 64% boost at DraftKings. And you can play around with the markets. Maybe not to reach the very final end of it, but you can pick you know, along the way in, in order to get them to certain moments in the path. With Which, if we're talking value and I just hate filling out brackets, that is an option, Senior. Can I convince you to do that instead? Oh, so you're anti-bracket <laughs> filling out. That's uh, what goes into all this, Claudia. No, you don't like filling out brackets. I, I like one bracket. I like one bracket. I have a futures on Kentucky, okay. and I'll probably put a you know in to build up my portfolio, get some some money on other squads that I like. But when it comes to brackets, I just I just can't I just can't have a million brackets that wow, I have that's, to that's... that I have to throw away because eventually that's what you do with all of them, don't you? <laughs> oh sure, exactly. But, but if I fill out ten brackets, if I fill out ten brackets. And seven are trash, that means three are good. If I fill out one bracket and it's lighted on fire after the third day, <laughs> that's it, I'm done. So yeah. I like having my options out there. And and wh- while I say that, let me also say, I don't then gloat if I picked an upset. People say, well, you can't sit there and say, oh, you picked this you know, 12, 5, or 11, and 4 because you had it on sheet 10. I'm like, that's cool. I'm not in it to say I picked the upset. I'm in it to win the cash. So that's all I care about. I don't I'm not I'm not saying I pulled the upset. I'm just saying I'm trying to manipulate a bunch of different bracket sheets out there so I can win some pools. That's what you do. At least that's what I do. Good strategy. It is. It's good. I'll give you it. I see. I I think that you should absolutely gloat still if you call some of these upsets the right way here. The whole point is they don't know you filled out a bunch of sheets in that <laughs> yeah. particular pool. They just see the one well, sheet that you they filled do. out there. And that really is like, if we're looking at this, yes, picking the correct final four, 
obviously is going to help you go far in your bracket. You ought to get as many teams right as possible. But really, this is also a tournament that's just predicated on upsets being the thing that fuels us for the first couple of weekends. Like, we're always looking for the Cinderella. We're always trying to identify that right now. So this year, it's going to be interesting to see that because on one hand, you're right, Claudia. Like, UConn is certainly going to get talked about a ton. You know, Donovan Klingon and the rest of that team trying to go back to back. Danny Hurley's squad winning their first Big East championship since coming back to the conference which was kind of an amazing thing to consider as they are last year's national champion as well. But you've got North Carolina and what they've done with R.J. Davis, Armando Baycott, that whole crowd that they've got there. But then on the other side, trying to go and try and pick these upsets. It's always my favorite because you get the fun name schools, Grand Canyon, Colgate, Long Beach State. We got JMU, the Dukes, having a hell of a season, both football and basketball now. And a lot of these teams, we know the 12-5 is usually where everyone tries to go for their upsets there. So... I, I don't know if, Claudia, you've identified a few you're going to go after now. I really do like the JMU Dukes, by the way, going up against number 5 Wisconsin. 12 road wins this season for James Madison. Most in Division One basketball. Very excited about that. McNeese, another 12-5 matchup going up against Gonzaga that everyone seems kind of down on. I don't know why I didn't watch them at all this year, but I know Will Wade is coaching McNeese. I know they shoot the hell out of the three-point ball, and so all of these kinds of things are now what I spend the next couple of days trying to look at because that's all I need is to be able to say I got one of these early upsets right to feel good about myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I listen. I, I'm. I'm. I am definitely. I, I'm with you. I under, and, and it seems the 11 seed is the new 12 seed. We used to always pick the 12 seed to beat the five, but the 11 beating the four has become pretty popular as well. Uh, but I, you know, a couple of things. UConn. What? What if the three three teams in there were in the final four last year? UConn, Florida Atlantic, San Diego State. Throw in Iowa State at the two seed, and then throw in Auburn at the four seed. Auburn has twenty seven wins, twenty six of them by double digits. I mean, they've been smoking teams in here. And I'm going to tell you right now, on the one sheet that I'm going to pick for our challenge that's going on, I am taking uh, Grand Canyon State to move two rounds. I'm picking them to beat St. Mary's, and then I'm picking them to beat Alabama. I'm just saying that right now. That's where I'm going. GCU, Grand Canyon, is going to win two games in this tournament. That's my big say right now, right off the bat, though I am subject to change my mind, Claudia. (laughs) Oh, so it's fluid. There you go. Although you're saying it right now. There you go. Yeah. It's, okay. yeah. it's a fluid situation. Grand Canyon, by the way, third tournament trip in four years. And we're always looking for good stories. We'll talk about one of our favorite NC State who just went on an historic run through the ACC tournament oh. to find their way into the tournament now. But uh, Tyson Grant, uh, Tyron Grant Foster, who's one of the star players for Grand Canyon, actually collapsed with a heart issue earlier in his college career, rehabbed, and then got back yep. and medically cleared to play. So someone that we always talk about, this tournament's about making stars, about making the future names that you'll yep. remember forever as we play one shining moment at the end of this. That's certainly going to be involved in it. But, Dad, our guy DJ Burns, the thick king from NC yep. State, the t- tournament most outstanding player, helping punch the ticket for NC State, also seems like a primetime candidate to get his name etched in stone. Yeah, yeah. They're in the uh, the, the South region. They take on Texas Tech uh, in the first round. And how about them? Five tournament wins, five days. What a run they went on. The last team to do that, I think it was either the 11 or 09 UConn Huskies. I can't remember which year it was, where they won five tournament games in five days to win the conference title. That's what North Carolina State does. But, you know, and we'll be talking to people this week about it. Does that that momentum carry, right? So that was a monster run by them, and God knows they need a couple of days off now. But now, does that carry? You know, does that momentum work? you know, five days later that I, I, I don't know. You know, they always talk about in baseball, the momentum is next day starting pitcher with basketball. You just go on a great run and then you got some time off before the first round. Does that continue? I, I do think there's something to be said. And we go to March Madness, with a lot of the same buzzwords every year. What teams got hot down the stretch? Who's limped into the tournament? Who's right. obviously been affected by injury and who's got, you know, a heavily senior upper class laden backcourt is usually all the things that end up making a decent competitive right. run, especially when you're looking for mid majors that are coming off these teams that are, you know, 28, 29, 30 win teams that know how to get this done and usually have some veteran pieces with it. It helps also though, if you're NC state to be able to chuck it down to 
beef. Again, our guy DJ Burns, we love him because yeah. he's 6'9", 275 pounds, and that 275 seems like it's pretty generous, but he's also got silky smooth yep. feet, incredible passing ability, and a bunch of great moves around the rim in the post. So very excited to watch our Thick King go out there and do his thing. Like we said, we will get into this week and get to plenty more of the snubs that people were upset about. We'll try and find and identify a Cinderella that you can check out. We will also get to the women's bracket upcoming in the next hour. As Claudia mentioned, we've got Neil Ivy from Notre Dame coming in. The second seed in that region was South Carolina. We'll look ahead at what everything is going on in the second hour for that bracket. But in the meantime, guys, uh, if we're going to talk about calories, uh, we might as well talk about our bracket that we're going to do around here, Claudia. We decided, in addition to the normal fare that we're going to do with everybody that we'll explain at a later date, uh, to dive into our own custom bracket that really speaks to the soul of this show. Yeah, you've heard of March Madness, but have you heard of Starch Madness? I haven't either, but now you're gonna, because we are crowning the champion of fast food <laughs> delights over the next few weeks. Go, Joe, fill them in, because I know you guys have been planning this for a while. You're very excited about this one. And I do want to give a hat tip. Now, we had this planned for weeks before this, but the Big Sky actually nicknamed their tournament Starch Madness since uh. it was playing uh, in the state of Idaho. I believe it was in Boise, obviously very potato famous. So hat tip to the Big yeah. Sky. We see you doing your thing over there. For us, yeah, guys, uh, Starch Madness is going to be a tournament of the best fast food items in the country. It'll feature 35 of those items split into four regions. Those regions are as follows. Mains, sides, desserts and drinks and they've got all the things that you could think of here i was throwing some polls out on twitter for the last couple of weeks taking the temperature on certain things trying to get some ideas so thank you to everybody over on the timeline that helped this out but dad we also kicked this off with a very important de uh, debate because we've got the first yep. four the first yes. round as we used to have to call it coming in we have decided to do ours around one particular portion of the fast food lore and that is fries mm -hmm. the fry four begins starch madness for us but different here normally the first four you're going into some lower seed when you win and get into the tournament the right. fry four is going to determine which fry entry gets into the sides bracket for us in the tournament and they will be the one seed because i think the one thing as we were getting ready yep. to do this that we all agreed on is fries are an absolute wagon but there's so many in different varieties yep. and certainly so many different restaurants that serve them that this is what we needed so we need democracy to help bail us out and figure out which of these fries are going to be in there how hungry are you right now dad uh, let me tell you I, I i love this i love this as a play-in and i love the fact that we're making it the one seed who is the winner of these fries because while we'll talk about mains in the fast food we know fries are kind of the glue what kind of fries are going with it you're always getting that meal you're not just getting the burger and what kind of fries are there you know, how does that hold all the meal together? You got the main, you got the fries, you got the drink, and you had the dessert. So those are the part of it. But let me tell you, I, the fries are so, that's why we are giving them the one seed. The Out of the four here, the winner of the play-in will be the one seed. I, I should have stuck around for these meetings a bit longer because I vehemently disagree with Five Guys fries. It, they're soaked in oil and they don't taste like anything. That should be Chick-fil-A fries. And I don't eat fast food, but I've eaten both of these fries and Five Guys fries are so overrated. So overrated. Oh, wow. Well, okay. Listen, I will say this. As we look at the Fry Four, which includes, if you're not watching on DraftKings Network and see this lovely graphic, we have got McDonald's fries, Arby's curly fries, Five Guys fries, and Checkers slash Rallies fries in the mix. And Claudia, this mm -hmm. was democracy. This is my timeline. This is what people, yep. when asked about the best fries, spit back at me. And as you mentioned, uh, if you're not someone that eats fast food often, it's all covered in oil. That's the whole bit. That's fast food. Ew, this is all yeah, caked in oil. And They're like the soggy. Max They're soggy. Soggy, it's different. It's yeah, different. I mean, <laughs> name me. Is there a fry not made in oil? I mean, they're well, they're all there. But, chick, and but they're not crispy because they're so they're soaked in oil. I can't be the only Chick Fil A's not Claudia? always crispy either. Claudia? They were right on the cusp of getting oh. in. They were the first out. No, Chick Fil A should be there. Claudia, you like everybody it. else. <laughs> Claudia, you get your vote like everybody else. Oh, I so will you vote, vote your conscience on this one. <laughs> I know which way I'm going here, so it's a nice way to start it all off. Uh, we'll see.
Uh, <laughs> this is a perfect way to start all of March Madness off. We will have more men's and women's bracket breakdown coming up. There's also a full day of March Madness coverage on DKN, including a special tonight, the Sweat Bracket Breakdown from 6 to 9 p.m. Eastern, hosted by our buddy Emerson Lazia. Check it out. Gojo and Golik. On Friday, we learned that Kenny Pickett was headed to Philadelphia, but then we learned from Adam Schefter, once they signed Russell Wilson, Pittsburgh, Pickett said he wanted to move on, which I guess does make sense, knowing that you'd probably be taking a backseat at one point. But wait, that's not all. Less than 24 hours later, we got news that Justin Fields was also being traded to the Steelers, with Pittsburgh sending a 2025 six-round pick that could become a fourth round if Fields plays 51% of the snaps in Pittsburgh. But because Russell Wilson is there, that sort of puts everything up in the air because word is Fields would be the backup. So will he really get 51% of the snaps? This seems very strange to me, Gojo, but I saw that you went on Twitter and retweeted and said, this makes a lot of sense. Was that being facetious or do you think this makes sense? to what went on with this little love triangle of teams but I will say this overall the ends of this once this was the station in life where Kenny Pickett was leaving Pittsburgh and you had Russell Wilson as the only quarterback there I agreed with a lot of what other smart people said which was hey why not take a flyer on Justin Fields at this point. And especially at the price you got him for Pittsburgh, this makes an overwhelming amount of sense mm. given the way that things yeah. went, where you wound up with a quarterback room where you got Russell Wilson on the cheap coming off, getting cut in Denver, and now you got Justin Fields for a six, a conditional six that turns into a fourth if he plays over 51% of the snaps, and not even in this year's draft, in next year's draft, so significantly less capital, Dad than the other four quarterbacks that we wow. saw under the age of 26 that got traded this offseason so far. So from the Steelers' standpoint, that's a coup as far as what they were able to pull off. 
I was just going to say, think of the other quarterbacks, whether starter or backups that were traded. Some got more money, like a Sam Darnold, what, 10 yeah. mil on uh, Minnesota. You know, Justin Fields is playing off, what, 3 mil on his, on his rookie contract? With the thing that is interesting, interesting to me is that normally you do what's right for you. Players try and do what's right for themselves. Teams do what's right for them. The Bears basically, you know, there were four other teams interested in, in trading, and it was Justin Fields' agent who asked Ryan Poles, listen, th those aren't teams we really want to go to. And they kind of did Justin Fields a favor, because I think this is a good landing spot for him. Now, he's not. this isn't going to be a competition, I don't believe at all. I think Russell Wilson's a starter, Justin Fields a backup. Uh, but, but I like the position he is in there. I'm just surprised that the Bears, who I think have made some really good moves this offseason, Mike, I'm surprised that this is the route they went of saying, you know what, we'll try and please you on where you want to go. Now, I don't know what the other deals were either. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say they passed up like a second rounder. I don't think that was ever offered. So right. it's not like I th don't think they passed up these monster deals. But it's still interesting to me that they did acquiesce a little bit and say, all right, we'll try and find a place that you want to go to as opposed to making the business deal of where we're going to send you. That's one of those things where I wasn't sure if that was a clever way to cover up the fact that they didn't get as much in return as most people would expect by saying, oh, well, we wanted to do this mm -hmm. guy a solid. We wanted to help him out. Or they very, right, well right. have, very well may have done it. Either way, it's a bit baffling because, as you said, most of the other guys that we saw move between Kenny Pickett, Mac Jones, some of the other names on this list, Sam Howell as well, were all moved to be clear backups. Now, Sam Howell was framed by Adam Schefter as someone coming into computer with Geno Smith, but I don't think that's actually real. But for everyone no. else, it was clearly as a no. backup. And Dad, that was kind of the message that got sent here was the league sees Justin Fields as a backup right now. I think the thing that's different for a lot of people is, is he's got so much talent, so much more raw talent than the rest of the names that we mentioned that we're a little surprised somebody else wasn't willing to take a flyer on him. But that does go into more of then how you feel about what you want in a backup quarterback. Do you want someone there that can have a little bit of talent that if it pops, you hit jackpot and all of a sudden have a long-term answer? Or do you want someone that's a little bit more stable, clearly going to be in the back seat and go from there? Because while you say that, yeah, he's the, not the day one starter in Pittsburgh, this is my chief confusion with this whole thing is if Kenny Pickett really asked out of Pittsburgh, I don't understand what he was yeah. thinking because you're going to a situation now where you're the backup in Philadelphia behind the clear starter in Jalen Hurts. And I understand there were some people miffed with Jalen Hurts after this last season, but you just paid that man the sun and the moon. He's sticking around and he's going to be your yeah. quarterback. You're going to be clearly the backup. Going into Pittsburgh, there aren't a lot of quarterbacks, veteran quarterbacks, that are more easily supplantable this year than Russell Wilson. Like, he might go in as their starter, but I can't imagine his station in life, given where the Steelers are at as a team, right. is going to be one where if he's not performing well, he's going to get a ton of time to see this thing through. Like, I don't think that's the case. And so being Russell Wilson's backup is a much closer ticket to being the starter than most backup jobs in football. And so for Justin Fields, that's a great opportunity of, hey, if he goes in and kicks the door down in a system with Arthur Smith on that offense that could very much cater some of the skills that Ru just, uh, Justin Fields has that Russell Wilson does not at this point, he puts himself in a good opportunity to get on the field sooner and later in a way that's not going to be the case for Kenny Pickett. So I, I don't understand if that was a long time coming, if that was an emotional decision or what, but it's one that I can't really wrap my head around. So, And listen, you're right. What Jalen Hurts is getting paid, and plus he's the man there. We, we, we know what he's done there, even though it was an off year last year. And uh, Russell Wilson, is you're, you're paying $1.2 million. So, and you're right, he's supplantable. And I, Justin Fields is going to be a starter somewhere in this league again, whether it's in Pittsburgh or somewhere else. And I'm looking forward to seeing what he does. Mike, this is a situation where, and, and in over the years and talking to younger players at times and, and just shooting the breeze about the league, the one thing I always try and, and say, which is easier said than done because I fell into that, was don't take things personal. Don't make a personal or emotional decisions. I did it when I left Philadelphia. You know, when I left Philadelphia as a, as a free agent, I didn't like what was kind of going on with the, the contract negotiation. They picked a, a first-round defensive tackle who ended up being a bust, and I took off from that. And I, I took it personal of the money, and I saw what, who they drafted, and I said, you know what, I'm moving on. I'm ticked off. I'm moving on. And, and sometimes you just got to sit and say, 
what's your best situation? Where is your best situation? I think Kenny, Kenny Pickett's, and, and he wouldn't be the first or the last, pride got in the way of I was a first-round pick. I know I'm a first-round quarterback. I know I can be a quarterback in the league. And that's great to think that. Everybody should think you're going to make it. But there has to be a moment of clarity that says, okay, what's my best situation? And I agree. I think his best situation was stay right there in Pittsburgh, see what Russell can do, knowing that you're closer to being the starter under center there than you are in Philadelphia. So it wouldn't shock me at all if the emotion and the personal side <clears throat> with his relationship in Pittsburgh got involved. Um, like I said, it's hard to put aside. It is hard to put aside. <laughs> oh, I'm choking up. I'm Are the you Kenny dying Pickett over there? This is green. Um, but, but you took a green shot before <clears throat> yeah, you came okay. on air, and now all of a sudden you're choking the life out of you right now. I did. <laughs> it must be taking its effect, full effect, and full wave over me. But I overall, I agree with you, and I th I think this is one of those kind of pride moves that said, "You don't want me here, fine. You don't want me to be a starter here, fine. I'll go show you somewhere else." And I don't think Philly was the place to go to show him a whole lot. Uh, no, and I mean, it's not like you had a ton of choice in all of that. Like, I, I, I don't know, Dad, at the right. end of the day, that right. part was probably the most confusing. I understand some people were hung up on the Capitol for what the Bears were able to get in return, but I think a lot of the things we mentioned, the fact that they waited so long into this market of quarterbacks that were all shifting seats and changing chairs to finally make this decision, everybody and their mother knew after the combine when Ryan Poles talked about it pretty openly that they were trying to deal Justin Fields, and they tried to do damage control on that after by a bunch of insiders going out and saying, well, well you know, this is a, a, a Caleb Williams thing. They haven't fully kicked the tires on him yet when we all know good and damn well they were moving on from him and they were getting ready to exercise that number one pick with the quarterback. So uh, the Bears... The return's not great. I do think, though, this is going to be a drop in the bucket. Like, I don't know if this is going to be enough for us to think differently about how well the Bears' offseason has gone overall and how well positioned they are going into the draft. Yes, you would have liked to have gotten a, gotten a bit more capital back, but ultimately now you get to fully turn the page and focus on your Caleb Williams-driven future. If you were, were starting a team and you only had two quarterbacks, you had to name your starter, Kenny Pickett or Justin Fields, who would you pick? I would choose Justin Fields. Justin Fields. Yeah, I wouldn't wouldn't really think twice about that at that point. Was a better prospect coming out. Certainly has shown some flashes, including this last year. What we saw in Chicago is part of the reason why. Now, all of a sudden, his future with a new offense and a new home becomes very enticing to people who saw that talent.
Welcome back to Gojo and Golik, one of the best defensive players of all time in Aaron Donald announced his retirement over the weekend from the Rams. Just look at all of these awards. The second he got into the league, one defensive rookie of the year, three-time defensive player of the year, eight-time first-team All-Pro, pro bowler in every season, all 10. Adam Schefter tweeted this out earlier, NFL Network here saying one of the greatest careers of all time. So with that, Senior, I ask you, can we put the GOAT label on Aaron Donald? Well, I mean, it depends. Uh, the GOAT, the GOAT on a defensive player, the GOAT on position. Because even to me, there are there are rooms, separate rooms in the Hall of Fame. And listen, I've, I, I've paid to get into the Hall of Fame to, to kind of figure that out because I don't even get a discount, I don't think. Um, but we always talk about who's in, in kind of the big rooms. And when you start talking defensive players, I, I, I think the two that have, and I've always thought that, Aaron Donald could enter this duo of, of the best. And the two best on the defensive side of the ball, to me, is Reggie White and Lawrence Taylor. So when we're talking about Aaron Donald and breaking it down, are we, start, are we going to talk about greatest defensive players all time? I think he put himself in that category, but I don't know if I put him ahead of those guys. But as far as interior D linemen, I, don't, I really don't think there's a question as far as that's concerned, if we go if we go by position, but I do agree. I think Mike he should be in that room with Lawrence Taylor and Reggie White. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's to me. However, you want to organize that medal stand, you're right. Right, because all three of those guys, and that's a testament to what Aaron Donald's done, is the fact that in real time, we didn't need to wait for his career to age or anything to just say, oh no, that's incredible. Because I think all the accolades that we listed there, I think one of the things that always comes up when we talk about the Hall of Fame, especially with quarterbacks, is were you considered the best at your position for a long stretch of time? Yeah. Aaron Donald, for years in his career there was probably a good three or four year stretch where we didn't just say he was the best defensive player in the world the best defensive tackle in the world we said he was the best football player in the world period that was whether yeah. it's you know arbitrary the nfl top 100 list that's an inexact science or what have you there were enough people that looked at what he did and the game record that he was for so long and said that's the best player regardless of position in the national football league and so yeah i, I absolutely think he stares eye to eye with all of those guys and he he is nobody's second when it comes to the greatest defensive player. And certainly in my lifetime, he is the greatest defensive player I've ever seen. I played against him in college right. mercifully before he started to supernova. He was always a great college player, but his last year at Pitt, 2013, 28 and a half tackles for loss to go along with 11 sacks as a consensus All-American. I mean, just video game numbers for a guy that was undersized relative to the standard that we all had going before that point really ushered in an era for defensive tackles that could be smaller in stature, 6'1", undersized, 285 pounds in that range, but be lightning quick and affect the game the way that he did, Dad. He's helped kind of change the paradigm at the position a little bit with that stuff, and he did it without getting over on me badly enough in college for me to end up on his draft day highlight reel, which still to this day is my proudest career accomplishment, which says more about my career than it does about anything else, but yeah. absolutely is the thing that I am most proud of is come his draft day, you did not see one highlight of Mike Gold Jr. at Notre Dame in 2012 getting tooled on. So let me let me ask you that. Since the three of us here uh, on the set right now, only one of us played against Aaron Donald. How was that? I mean, you knew what he was going into the game. You knew how great he was. So you're preparing. You're an old lineman. You're an offense preparing to play against Aaron Donald. Mm. What was the thought process? And then also, when he actually lined up over you during a play and you know help was going the other way and you had him one-on-one, -on -one, what was going on in your mind? Hold. Hold on for dear life. That's all you can really do because <laughs> the, the thing about Aaron Donald and, and the most, the, it's the it's the overwhelming quickness, the first step stuff that you've seen over and over. And the, in the days since he announced his retirement, they've shown so many of his all-time great plays. And I think for him, he's got one of those legacy plays too. Like you look at his postseason stats and what he did in 11 career postseason starts. He was incredible in those, and he shut the door on that final fourth down play in the Super Bowl against the Bengals right. with a sack against. Look, he did these against mm -hmm. double teams. The greatest Aaron Donald set that I saw from ESPN Stats and Info over the last five years, the NFL's average pass rush win rate, so how often you beat blocks in under two and a half seconds, counts as a win for a defensive lineman. 
His pass rush win rate, the average against single one-on-one pass blocks was 17% for qualified rushers. Aaron Donald posted an 18% win rate against double teams in that time span. He was better at double teams, beating double teams, than the average NFL pass rusher was at being blocked one-on-one. And that, to me, was the hallmark of Aaron Donald because you saw on the game-winning sack for the Super Bowl, he was supposed to be double teamed. They had slide help coming his way, and it didn't matter. Like, when you're an offensive lineman, if I know I have the slide coming to my side, I overset. You get outside and you invite him to come in because you got a bat out of hell ready to put their helmet right between his chest plates and try and knock him the hell out with Aaron Donald you couldn't get out there quick enough guys were getting beat to the place you never are supposed to get beat when you've got double team help with him and it's because he was so quick it's because his hands were so violent and lethal and efficient and he was still so strong that the minute you spent extra energy trying to get outside trying to move too fast dad someone you know very well and Reggie White that hump move that was predicated on the same thing Aaron Donald's power could hurt you in similar ways because he was so fast So you were so worried about the speed, but as we all saw, for a guy who practiced with actual knives and had a six-pack playing D-tackle, you couldn't sleep on the power either, and that combination was deadly. So he, you know, you work on moves all the time. I remember asking Chris Jones this at the Super Bowl. I said, because he was double teamed the most um, as a defensive tackle this time around. And I said, can you even work on that? Can you practice breaking double teams? You know, you don't... Practice that in one on one, right? We we both done the drill, the one on one drill. You don't you don't you don't say okay, let's go. You know, double team Chris Jones one on one. Here we go, ready break. You don't do that. So and and what impresses me about guys like Aaron Donald is and Reggie White and Lawrence Taylor is they don't just beat you at times. They'll beat you with you know a hand slap or an arm over or a rip or the 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 hump move that Reggie has. They win because they put you in position to lose. It's not just a, a, a fair one-on-one fight where O Lyman's going to try his thing, D Lyman's going to try his thing. They, with their first move, get you in a position where they're going to beat you. They make you get out of position, so they're going to win the battle, which which always amazed me. Justin Pugh, the former or, or the the um, O Lyman for uh, the Giants, said not many guys are pound for pound that strong at that size. You look at him and you're like, oh. I'm looking down on him. He's not that big. And, there he get, and then he gets that great get off. He's quicker than any defensive end and stronger than any defensive tackle. And he's strong, but I'm telling you right now, strength also, you can be physically strong, but leverage makes you seem a hell of a lot stronger. When you get leverage on somebody, now Reggie was strong. Reggie did bench, Reggie did cleans, and Reggie did squats, and he did them heavy. He was strong. But those moves, the hump move, was really a leverage move. He got an old lineman running so far out to get him that he just used the dude's leverage against him, and that's something Aaron Donald does so well. You're so worried about that first step of his that you overset whatever it is that you now, with the start of the play, have put yourself in a bad position, and he feels on that he was a force of nature in a position that's now become and been seen as incredibly important in the NFL we talked about this last offseason Chris Jones getting the payday here Quinn and Williams before him Dexter Lawrence Justin Matabike all these guys this position has become so valued by so many people in part because of how the league's changed but also because of what Aaron Donald showed you like man when you've got a guy that can impact the game up the gut in front of all these quarterbacks the way that he did it completely changes the math on the equation so congratulations Aaron Donald this has to be one of the most celebrated retirements on earth because even at this age he was still someone that O-linemen all around the league had to fear because speed's the number one thing you check off the list I think if you ask any interior guy especially you'd much rather a big guy than a guy with that level of athleticism the final challenge for Aaron Donald that I lay down to him in retirement is here does he have the courage does he have the ability the work ethic and the pride to get fat now Because he spent a whole career being the D-tackle with a six-pack now. He's earned some rest. Aaron Donald, I challenge you, get a big old belly and then walk back to your Hall of Fame ceremony where, oh, by the way, that Hall of Fame ceremony in five years is going to have Jason Kelsey and Aaron Donald mixed in the same stage. We'll see who's got the bigger belly then.
Coming up in about 10 minutes, Notre Dame women's basketball head coach Neil Ivey will join us to talk about their great season. Hannah Hidalgo, their star freshman guard who's got face of the sport type potential. And hell, it's hard to even call it potential. She's the ACC Rookie of the Year, Defensive Player of the Year, and Tournament's Most Outstanding Player of the Year, all for a coach who also won a national championship as a player at that school. So excited to talk to her and look ahead at the women's bracket coming up here soon. I do want to remind people at Gojo and Golik on Twitter is where they can vote in our Starch Madness bracket. Again, a, te- a bracket of all of the top fast food menu items from mains, sides, uh, drinks, and desserts that you're going to be able to vote on over the next month. We will crown a champion alongside March Madness as well. We're starting off today in the voting, Dad, with the Fry Four, trying to figure out a one seed in the sides region with French fries. We've got Arby's fries, McDonald's fries, Five Guys, and Checkers and Rallies. McDonald's out to an early lead with about a 1,000 votes already counted. So get out and vote there, Dad. Has any part of this surprised you? No, I, I think McDonald's fries are kind of the trustworthy fries that, that's kind of the go-to fry. And, and again, you have till the start of the show, 8 o'clock Eastern tomorrow morning, uh, as far as how far this vote will go. I do like some of the comments. Kevin says, Burger King not being in there at number in the four is a monstrosity. Kevin, you appreciate your opinion. We disagree. But hey, if you like Burger King fries, do your thing. I like how Pete broke it You're down. wrong. He said the Checkers Rally Fries are like the Gonzaga of the bracket. Has all the credentials on paper and always good enough to make it to the show, but nobody can find them on the map, and they'll be bounced out too early. That's a nice breakdown by Pete. That's well done. That's well done. And you're right. They're going to get bounced out here. It'll be very interesting. The regional politics of all of this are going to be the undertone that I am most excited to pay attention to because as we'll reveal the rest of the bracket in the coming days here – There's a lot of variety of this when you think of places like Cookout. Obviously, you've got McDonald's, Taco Bell, Burger King, all of the tried and true ones. But there's a few regional varieties that I think are going to make the voting very, very interesting. So again, we got about a 1,000 votes tabulated already. We will give you the winner of the Fry Four. That's going to be the one seed in the sides region coming up tomorrow at 8 a.m. Eastern. So you've got plenty of time to get out and vote. Do your part because I figured fries were going to be the most hotly contested, only including one fry varietal and one restaurant's fries in there already a controversial decision but we stand by our committee we've got a very strict set of guidelines that involve net rating quad one wins all the things that we take into account for building what we think is one of the best brackets in sports speaking of one of the best brackets in sports claudia uh one of the parts that we talked about for march madness that's so fun for everybody is the upsets finding cinderella stories and thankfully we got a lot to choose from this season here some insane stories popped up down the home stretch of college basketball season yeah, like fired coaches continuing to coach and then getting a bid, which is exactly <laughs> yeah. what we star, saw, saw. But let's start with NC State's head coach, Kevin Keats, who was on the hot seat, not fired, but he was close to it. Then they won five games to win the ACC title and bid, which then triggered a two-year contract extension worth at least $7 million. <laughs> and then, like I mentioned, awesome. Long Beach State head coach Dan Monson got fired on Monday, but he was allowed to keep coaching, which he did, and then won the Big West tournament getting a bid. All part of the plan, right, Coach? It was great. It was a great, I mean, I've had a a, a blessed, God has blessed me with a great career, and these kids uh, have have been awesome to coach. And uh, when when Jim Harbaugh says, who's got it better than, than him, somebody needs to tell him Dan Munson. I got the 99 run at Gonzaga, but... As Mark Fuchs said in a text, why don't we have a run at the first year and one in the last? So, but I don't think this is my last. I love coaching. I love teams. I need a new challenge, uh, but uh, it, it, it's life. It's uh, on to the next chapter. Senior, the madness has begun. You called it awesome. It is pretty awesome, isn't it? <laughs> That's stunning, though, right? It's one thing to be on the hot seat, and then you you go, like I said, North Carolina State did what UConn did, I, I, as I said, I think at 11 or 9, whichever it was, winning five day, games in five days to win the conference title. But to be fired and then say, you know what, you're fired, but we're going to let you coach tournament, just kind of play it out, and now you get to keep, keep – now you're in the tournament, that is amazing. That what, and, and what – you know, Dan Monson's been around for a while – uh, so he's a classy dude, uh, and the way he handled all of that. But what a what a wild situation! I'm not gonna lie, Mike. I haven't seen something like that before, where you were fired, 
We've seen coaches that are fired sometimes in football go on and coach the bowl game, but it really has no meaning. It doesn't matter. They actually got fired and they win the tournament and got in into their, their conference tournament to get into the NCAA tournament after being fired. That is something I'd never seen before. Uh, so this was framed as a mutual parting of ways for a coach that had been there about 17 years. He mentioned he was an assistant on that 99 Gonzaga staff. So you've got like 25 right. years in between those runs, but dad, for a guy that right there said, I want to continue coaching, I don't know how mutual I believe that to be. And if that's the case, yeah. which these things yeah. usually hardly ever are, this has to be such a wonderful, petty, satisfying feeling to now go and get to stick it with them like this, where there's a potential now, we're getting ready to go in the tournament, it's going to be interesting what they're able to do. Uh, they play Arizona, the two seed, in the first round there. Yeah. But he's got experience in this particular arena. He knows this tournament very well, knows the anatomy of an upset. So they instantly become a very froggy team in this. But again, the petty part in me really roots and identifies yeah. with the petty part in him. So congratulations to Coach Monson for making that kind of run and punching the ticket in the tournament. Dad, it, it does sort of bring up, though, some of the existential conversations around tournament expansion that people have talked about. We had Jay Will on here when he brought this up and looking at teams like Long Beach State, looking at a lot of these other single bid leagues that get in when they win their conference championship. If you're to expand the tournament, I think we saw coaches around college basketball asked about this and reflecting on this. If you start to expand, I think the worry from a lot of people is what we've seen in college football with the playoff and recently the changes where the big power conferences are looking and saying, there's more of us. We've got these super conferences with 18 teams getting closer to 20 teams in these conferences. Why wouldn't we make sure more of us are getting in? We're playing each other. We're yeah. in the better yeah. leagues here, supposedly. Why wouldn't we do what football's doing and carve out more of the space like this in a way that could end up adversely affecting some of these mid-major programs that make their entire financial windfall off of the money that comes from the tournament, but certainly build reputation, build lore, and make March Madness what it is? Well, you lose that Cinderella story, right? Or that Cinderella first round or that Cinderella upset. You know, that we all wait for, you know, coming up Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, all the games that are going to be played. No, by the way, as we'll get into, the most, the procedure that happens the most to men, this is a tease for a couple of days, happens this week. <clears throat> we'll break it down. The procedure that happens to men happens the most this week. Oh, you're talking about vasectomy week, season. So. <laughs> yes, this is vasectomy season. Guys get vasectomy so they can miss work and watch those Thursday, Friday games. It's a hell of a price to pay, uh, you know, to watch them some basketball. Uh, but, but men do it. Obviously, they're going to do it anyway, and they just wait for this time to do it so they can get their frozen bag of peas, you know, ice themselves down and watch these upsets in the first round. What's the, what, what, Claudia? What don't you understand just, about just that one? Just dudes being dudes, man. That's, that's wild, but I guess it makes yeah. sense. Sky math right there. <laughs> That's yeah, guy math. If I'm going to get this done, why not get it done where it can benefit me? Yeah. I can't do anything physically. I have to lay there with frozen peas on my junk. So why not be doing it while I'm able to watch something? And now you get to watch some great basketball and some Cinderella stories start their, their, uh, their avenue or start their run. So it's a very cool thing. March Madness, baby. Is it cool? <laughs> Well, I like I give said, if label. you're going to get it done anyway, if you're going to get it done anyway, that's, I think that's smart. So you know what? I'm going to wait till this, this particular time where I don't have to find another way. I actually have a legitimate reason I'm going to miss work and then I can watch the basketball game. So yeah, that's, that's, if you're going to get it done anyway, might as well get it done to your advantage. Yeah. That feels like something that if you're going to get it done with the ultimate goal in mind, I'd imagine to be to not have any more babies, you would want to do that as soon as possible because all it takes is one sort of fun evening where things get away from you for all of a sudden you beat the buzzer on this and now you wind up with a little bit bigger family than you had planned. Maybe Between you and your spouse, man. Between you and your spouse. <laughs>
Welcome back to Gojo in Golic. On Sunday, number two, Notre Dame learned it'll host the first and second rounds of the women's NCAA tournament facing Kent State to kick it off. The guys caught up with Notre Dame's head coach, Neil Ivey, to talk about the season and what's to come. All right. Super excited right now. Going to try not to fangirl too hard right now as we welcome in ACC Championship head coach Neil Ivey, kind enough to join us from the Notre Dame Fighting Irish Women's Squad. Coach, how you feeling right now? It's March. We're finally here getting ready for the tournament. How are you? I am great. I, this, I'm still, I feel, it still feels surreal for me. So we've been celebrating all week and just so excited and happy it's March and just ecstatic ecstatic about the uh you know the ACC championship so this is toward the end obviously after the ACC championship getting ready for the tournament let's go back and and start with this team you know you, you when you don't know what Hannah Hidalgo is going to do and what she turns out doing but when this season was going to start what were your thoughts going into it well definitely I always felt like just wanted to stay healthy I mean I feel like that's what I always feel like as a coach wanting to come into the season getting healthy at the time you know unsure if Liv was going to be able to come right. back. Um, you know, we came off of a foreign tour, so got a chance to see a lot this summer. Had a bunch of practices. We had 10 practices before we went overseas, played two games, and I thought that this was a special group. So that's what I – I guess that's where my 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 thoughts were going into the season. Never did get to ask you, how was it overseas? How did you enjoy that trip? I loved it. And uh, we posted a lot. We had a, a, a yacht party. We ate well. You know, we won, uh, you know, very big overseas and got a chance just to really just let our hair down. The, the girl, they had such a fantastic time. It was a life changing experience for them. We bonded. We got a lot closer. And it's just an opportunity just to celebrate each other um, and to, do, to be in a different setting, see a different culture. It, it was amazing. And you mentioned that bond, that that off-the-court work that you guys did got put to the test during the season. There were definitely ups and downs in the middle of the year, and I thought such an interesting bit of symmetry, your guys' last loss in the season back in February to NC State at home, and then you finish off the year in the regular season with that win over them in the tournament. I'm curious, in that time in between, what happened? What was the conversation like with your guys' team after that game that allowed you to go on the kind of run we've seen? Absolutely. Well, I felt like we were, you know, we had a bunch of highs and lows, you know, so we had some incredible wins at UConn, at Tennessee, but then we had some um, disappointing losses. And I always felt like this group, after we took tough losses, we really responded. And so after the NC State game, it was it was our worst start, our worst half. We scored 18 points at the half at home. And for me, I always want to win, but I definitely want to play well in front of our crowd. And I, I just felt like I really disappointed uh, our fans we took a mirror to ourselves and just kind of talked about what we needed to do individually to get better as a team, what we needed to do to get better. And they responded. You know, we had a big Monday game um, two, three days later against at Duke, which was a big test for us. And we we succeeded in that. We, we started to gel. Um, but we had to have those conversations about um, things that we needed to do a better job of as a unit to find some cohesion because we didn't have it. We didn't have it for 40 minutes. Uh, we started games slow, um, and those are, uh, um, attributed some of our losses and just had to take a step back and really just assess what we needed to do to get better. And and they did. They committed to it. Kind of like they recommitted to the vision, the goal. And, um, you know, we just started, you know, building game by game and started gaining momentum and peaking at the right time. So peaking at the right time, at what point did you look at this team's play and say, okay, this is what I expected out of this team? Yes. At home <laughs> – at um, you know, at Duke, I thought that was a big win for us. Um, we've lost the last two games versus Duke, and I thought that was a big win. It is a very tough place to play in Cameron Indoor, and I thought we we came out on fire. It was an ESPN game, and I thought that was a that was a big moment for us. Um, it get, we gained a lot of confidence, and then I would say Virginia Tech at home uh, with Kitley, you know, with their with their best post player. Mm -hmm. I think that's when I started. I, I saw a turn. I saw it trending in the right direction for us. We started the game really well. We really relied on our defense. Our defense was fantastic, a ton of energy. And then we carried that over. We had a home home game stand and played a Louisville at home and beat them as well. And so like that for me, that weekend was a big step for us in the right direction. You mentioned defense. It's the perfect segue to talk about uh, Hannah Hidalgo and, and what she's meant to the team this year. ACC Rookie of the Year, ACC Defensive Player of the Year, most outstanding in the tournament. She's got every accolade you could hope for, and it seems like those will keep rolling in. For her, when did you know she was different as someone coming in who hadn't played for you guys yet? 
Right. Just recruiting her. I know she was, you know, just fiery. So, I mean, she always separated herself from the recruiting class by the way she played. She played with so much passion, energy, having conversations with her high school coach, which is her dad and um, her AAU coaches. They're like, she's different, Neil. Like she's going to change your culture. And I'm like, so I knew what I was getting um, by signing her. It was a big moment signing that class. And then when she stepped on campus, I, I obviously watched her USA basketball. She competed for the gold medal in Madrid, won that. And she was all star five. So one of the five best players in the world. So that's when I was like, OK, she loves the big stage. That's what I knew. Uh, that stage was insane. The atmosphere was all in the Madrid's, you know, Spain's favor. They played Spain for the championship. And I was like, she's born for this moment. And then obviously our first game versus South Carolina in Paris, huge stage. And she had 34 points <laughs> her first game. And I'm like, OK, she's the real deal. You know, um, just need her to get a little bit of experience. And that's when I knew. I mean, every big game, every big moment this season, she's she's risen to the occasion. And she's a big stage type player. And that's what I knew right from the beginning. It is amazing when you get a high profile player coming out of high school. You can think that's going to be great. And then, you know what? You just never know. You never know what yes. the next step's going to bring, but we found out with Hannah, it came pretty quickly, uh, her greatness. How about you? And I know, and as most do, don't you don't like talking about yourself, but the accolades as a player, the accolades as an assistant coach, and now as a head coach, ACC champ, so that, you know, you're sitting in the big chair, you're the CEO, you're the big dog now, and you get that big thing to go with it. What, what has it been like for you personally? A dream come true, to be honest. Um, I feel like coming in, obviously following a legend in Muffet, um, you still have I still have to find a way to pave my own personal have put my stamp on the program. Um, I'm fortunate, like you mentioned, as a player and assistant, but as a head coach, that was my vision to bring the title back here um and hopefully to get a national championship along with that. And to see it come to life um has just been a dream. I I, I stood on that stage and I was this is what I envision. This is the conversations I'm having in the, in the on the Zoom calls, you know, with our recruits talking about what I feel like I can do for the program and to try to continue the success that Coach McGraw has built here. And it was just an overwhelming experience. I mean, I got emotional about it. It's just I love this university and to be able to have the experience and bring that experience to this team and to watch them overcome adversity, but also to me, I feel like I'm watching them become the best versions of themselves. They're being they're confident. And as a coach, that's what you you dream of. And I, I'm just I'm so proud of them. And it's just been really really exciting. It's been an exciting week for me. You mentioned Coach McGraw a couple of times. Saw the moment after where you walked over to the ACC Network set, and she's sitting right there. And I see tears <laughs> in her eyes. What were you thinking as you walk over and see this woman, your mentor, your coach, you know, sitting there staring at you with that kind of admiration? Yeah, I mean, I know that she was so proud. So I just wanted to share that moment with her, give her a big hug. Just my my way of showing her gratitude. I know I say it a lot, um, but she means so much to me. My role model, my mentor, somebody that has poured into me. And I got a chance to learn from her every day. You talked about greatness. I, I watch greatness every day, you know, as a player, as 12 years as an assistant. And so I soaked up a lot of knowledge of she showed me the way. She showed me how to do things the right way. And so to be able to experience that and share that with her was 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 very special for me. So uh, you mentioned forging your own path. I'm curious because you you lived your basketball life as a player with her. You lived your basketball life as an assistant with her. What's the thing you found yourself? You knew like I want to take this from Coach McGraw. This is absolutely something I need in there. And has there been anything that surprised you where all of a sudden you were like, no, I'm never going to be like this. I'm never going to do that when it's my way. That maybe seems a little bit more familiar than you give yourself credit for. Oh, that's a great question. Um, I always just feel like being in the seat. I understand more. I don't know if that answers your mm. question. Like there were a lot of things as an assistant, you don't really understand what a head coach is tackling. There's so many things that you, there's so many hats you have to wear. There's so many things that they're battling with. And so I guess sitting in this chair and now you add COVID NIL transfer reporter, like you, there's so many other layers to coaching that I always remember her saying, I just can't wait to get to practice. Like and she used to be so excited for practice. I understand that now because it's like 90% everything else and 10%, you know, actually X's and O's. So I don't know if that answers your questions, but that's that's what comes to mind when I think of 
um, taking over this program and thinking about her as a head coach. I asked the question very poorly. You answered it very well. So thank you for bailing me out. That's, sometimes you got to overcome coaching. You did it there with me. So I appreciate it. So I, I, I'm wondering as we, as we get ready to start the tournament and in any sport, when you get into the, the main part of it, a championship tournament, championship games, whatever, you know, who your stars are Hannah Hidalgo, Son, uh, uh, Sonia Citron and Maddie Westbell. We, you, we hear so much about what they mean, that trio and the scoring and all that. But you need others. Who are who is that unsung person that can step up one or two players that you're going to need to make that deep run? You need your stars, but you need that other person to step up. Absolutely. Um, I would say I got three. Natalia Marshall, <laughs> she came in. Her first career start was in the title game and did really well, came out with stitches. You know, she just yeah. stepped in and did whatever we needed, um, had made some big plays. Anna DeWolf, um, this is going to be for her first time playing in the tournament. It's her first time going to the tournament and she's definitely an unsung hero. I need her to score and her leadership. And then KK Bransford, she literally is my super glue, like, or my Swiss army knife. But sometimes I run, I, she comes at the four. Sometimes I run her, have her run in the point. Um, you know, so she does, she's like a point forward. So she, those three, I feel like are going to have to step up big to help us because at some point, you know, the big three, you know, they're going to have the best defenders on them. So I need our support system um, to really step up. And and we need everybody. My number rosters being so low, like everyone has to do more. And and, I, and I'm going to really rely on those three to help us. Coach, was it someone who has lived this tournament as a national champion, as a player, has been a part of it as an assistant coach here? What are you telling this team as far as the key to having success when it comes to the most impactful tournament in sports? Right. Um, I think just the, having that March mindset, that's kind of what I talked about in the ACC tournament. Like, you got to turn it on. You know, this is you're one and done. It's survive in advance. And so you have to play your best game every every time you step on the floor, which is a lot of pressure. But, like, you have to understand it's a different mindset in March. And I think that that's what we had um, down in Greensboro. Like, they, re- they knew that. And they came out with swag, confidence, and, like, a will. You have to have a will to win no matter – what what seating we end up being or whatever the the road is you got to have that mindset and you have to have that will and so that's why I talk about a lot with uh, I would be remiss as a parent not to ask you this as as you're leading the Notre Dame women to hopefully a title an ACC title and now on to the to the tournament you're also the mom of an NBA player your son Jaden now the team not doing all that well but your son third leading yeah. scorer on the team in Detroit have you been able to watch a lot of that how has that gone it's been amazing. I mean, league pass, I get a chance to watch all his game, I, all his games. I tape all of his games and we had a couple of days off this week. So I got a chance to get up to Detroit, spend some time with him um, and my grandson and went to their game two nights ago. They beat the Raptors. So we're two in a row. You know, they got a game tonight. So I'm excited. I mean, I, it's for me, my gift is to be there, to be present. And so when I can actually be there in person and support him in the stands, like that means the, the most to me, it gives me opportunity to have balance with, you know, obviously the pressure of this, this job, I get a chance just to be a Mimi and a, and a mom. And I love that. Are, are you able to just go full mom and full Mimi there? Is there ever anything where like you see stuff in his game and all of a sudden yeah. coach starts to come out? <laughs> yeah, Sometimes, but it, we're, he's at a point in the season that I'm like, you know what? <laughs> now early on, you know, preseason, I was talking more. Now it's kind of like, Hey, you're healthy. You know, that is that kind of thing. But I, whatever he needs, I try to give him whatever he needs. Coach, looking around for you on campus here, too, I, I've been sort of struck by so much of the changing of the guard on Notre Dame's campus and a lot of the high-profile coaching jobs here. Obviously, Coach Freeman a few years in at the football program, Coach Shrewsbury in his first year on the men's basketball side. And obviously, you, you're someone who's got such a deep history with this school, but mm-hmm. you were in the head coaching chair. I'm curious how much you guys have leaned on each other, how much you guys talk, what do you trade amongst each other on this campus now with a group of young coaches trying to all carve out their own way? Right. I have a great relationship with with Coach Freeman and Micah. They're awesome. Obviously, Micah in the same building. You know, I, I'm always trying. We we're, we watch each other's practices. I sat down with him right when he got hired, just like, all right, let's just powwow X's and O's. Like, you know, talk to me about your philosophy and, you know, your, you know, things like that. Like a lot of X's and O's. And he's he has such a sharp mind um, and so much experience. So I really picked his brain a lot in the offseason and um, they're both great colleagues. They're not just my colleagues, like they're my friends. And 
Um, I, they know that whatever they need, you know, um, I'm here for them. I bring my recruits in to, to speak to both of them. You know, it really is a family and it's, it's very authentic. It's very genuine. Um, Coach Freeman is the best. He, you know, Micah comes as well to the games, but Coach Freeman has been to so many games um, after the season. And it wasn't just because sometimes, you you know, big high, high profile coaches, they'll come their first game, you get hired. No, he's consistent with his support. And that's what I love about everyone on this campus, all of our legendary coaches, that we all support each other, especially those two. Um, and I'm, I'm very fortunate that I have, um, you know, people that I can lean on because this definitely is, it's a lot, you know, it's both leading these type of programs. You need to have that support that you can lean you know, and have those people that you can lean on. And I feel like we, all three of us do a great job of supporting each other. You do, but coach, I can say you and the Notre Dame women's basketball program have given everyone not only a lot to support, but a ton yep. to be proud of both through your time as a player all the way up and through now. It's been a ton of fun watching someone who I know the university means so much to come back and, and give so much to it and give us all something really to get excited about and cheer about. So congratulations on all the success, coach. We can't thank you enough for what you do for the university. Best of luck in the tournament. We're all excited to watch and go Irish. Thank you so much. Uh, and you look right now, there are the tournament odds for Notre Dame heading into March Madness in the women's bracket. We're again, they're the two seed in the same region as South Carolina facing a bit of an uphill battle right now. So plus 4,500 to go and win the entire tournament. And dad, that road got even harder. We got to catch up with Coach Ivy at the end of last week before that announcement that they'd see South Carolina, the same team that they played in Paris to start the season and got beat pretty badly by yep. uh, in that team. They've certainly developed a lot since then, but the injury bug, unfortunately, striking again at poor timing after the seeding announcement yesterday, Neil Ivy got the news that Kylie Watson, unfortunately, tore her ACL in the ACC tournament. And so yep. they're going to be shorthanded again going into this. And that was the whole idea coming into the season. They were shorthanded with Olivia Miles still not back. There's a lot of people that had been eyeing next year saying, well, look at the development of Hannah right. Hidalgo. You had Olivia Miles before, who was that version of that dog point guard for Notre Dame, and now the combination of the two, certainly tantalizing. But this Notre Dame team, in what they did, shorthanded winning the ACC title the way they did, absolutely has earned respect and has earned our belief that they can go and make something out of this tournament run still. Yeah, I mean, listen, it, it was a fantastic run, no doubt, no doubt about it. You know, they know they're getting miles back next year, and you're right. Everybody kind of looking toward next year as this team that could really make a run because, yeah, it, it, it's tough sledding, I mean, with South Carolina. I mean, I know they got beat. South Carolina did last year by Iowa in the Final Four. So, But still, this team, I, I don't know who's stopping South Carolina. Certainly, I hope Notre Dame gets the chance and – you know, it's all you're looking for is a chance. Once they tip the ball off, you never know what can happen. But this team, and I know they they got that big uh, three pointer to beat Tennessee in the tournament uh, to escape a loss there. But overall, I just think they're they're going to be too good in this tournament. Like I said, I hope Notre Dame we match up against them in this. But uh, yeah, injury certainly can uh, can take their toll now. Yeah, that's what kind of everyone's got circled and is paying attention to in March. I, I will say, I know we're going to talk about the women's bracket here in, in a little bit shortly, and it's the entire show and economy around Caitlin Clark that's certainly going to take center stage, but it was cool last night. You watch how all of this is presented. We've talked about the strides that women's sports have made, especially in the investment on the broadcast side, and watching last night to see... No, the ESPN bracket reveal oscillate back and forth between the men's and the women's bracket, the analysts for both sports present on set, it truly getting equal footing and equal billing yep. in the way that both sides of the sport are discussed. We know going back a couple of years to the fi fiasco inside of March Madness only being licensed to the men's tournament, the unequal gifts that you saw going out to both sides here now in that short time period being properly shamed the way the NCAA was combined with the star turn for so many people on the women's side of the sport has really gotten that caught up in a hurry in a way that's encouraging it shouldn't have taken that much to begin with but we yeah. know unfortunately how these things work yeah listen i'm with you we've talked about this before the storylines beat the men's storylines right now so uh, I, I think these could be two excellent tournaments. And look at some of the names on the women's side we're going to lose after this tournament. But Juju Watkins for the a freshman for the number one seed, a number one seed in USC. Hanana Halgo, uh, Halgo, as we talked about for Notre Dame for a number two seed as a freshman. The the future is bright 
continues to be in women's basketball. The future's bright, but coming up next, the present still belongs to Caitlin Clark. We'll talk about Iowa's path to a legacy-building moment next. Go Joe and Golick. The road to a title for Caitlin Clark in Iowa will not be an easy one. Yeah, they're a number one seed. Yes, they're hosting the first and second rounds, but they have to get through the most difficult region in the bracket. Here's what Clark had to say about her last dance. I think just understanding how long it was last year and how you really have to go game to game, you know. After you kind of get out of the first round, every team is basically a top 25 team. That's what you're looking at. And um, we were on the upset side of that my sophomore year, and then obviously we were very fortunate last year. And um, you need a little, you need a little luck. You need a good draw. You need to be playing your best basketball. But um, I think the biggest thing for me is just enjoy every single second because this is like the most fun basketball. You heard me say it. Like I think this is the greatest postseason tournament in all of sport. You don't have it one night, you're out of luck. But if you do have it and you can string some games together, you can put a put a special run together. So um, I'm really excited, honestly. Well, yeah, you need luck, but also having Caitlin Clark doesn't hurt either. Now it's yeah. time for Cash It or Trash It presented by DraftKings. Stay tuned to hear everything that DraftKings has to offer throughout the show. The crown is yours. Iowa guys, plus 550 to win it all. Second only to South Carolina, the favorite at minus 120. Gojo, are you cashing or trashing an Iowa title? So... I don't want to throw a bunch of cold water on this, but I'm probably trashing it just because South Carolina exists. We know last year Iowa loses to eventual national champion LSU, who Claudia mentioned in their region, an absolute juggernaut yeah. of a group you've got in that region with Iowa as the one seed. 
UCLA is the two seed out of the Pac-12 who's been sensational this year. LSU is the three seed who finished as the runner-up to South Carolina in the SEC title game. And then, oh, by the way, Kansas State at the four seed that beat Iowa early in the season back in their first meeting at November. So not an easy path to go. Certainly South Carolina's got Notre Dame in their region and some other teams that are potential roadblocks. But with that bunch, with Carmilla Cardoso and the you know advantage she presents inside, she's going to miss that first game because of the suspension from the SEC yeah. championship game fight, but make the run through the rest of the tournament where dead. They can shoot. They've got great three-point shooting on the outside. They've got all that size. This is a South Carolina team that feels inevitable. That's the only undefeated team left in D1 on the men's or women's side. And so it's going to be tough, but I, I also think that with Caitlin Clark, we've had so much of this talk, and Jay Will, who came on with us last week, was the source of the take. Caitlin Clark does not need this tournament as a legacy builder. Legacy secured, no. star power, no. juice. Like there is, I, there's still something to gain, and if she wins a championship, it absolutely adds to the well, lore. But she by no means needs this. No, she doesn't. But you know, it's a team sport, and all her accolades are individual accolades. So. The, 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 I mean, you know this. You were you were as close to it as anybody. You and Jake in this family of hitting all zeros on a clock and being a championship. You were at least in a championship game. I was never close to this. That, that feeling at the end of a season to know what you accomplished as players, as teammates, what in that locker room because that's what players miss the most is is incredible. It's got to be an incredible feeling. So to her, I think that is a big void for her personally, but you're right for her stature in the, in the game. It's not, she has solidified her greatness in the game, but this would be what a cherry on top for her uh, to win this title. But is it, it is a tough road. You're right. I mean, going through Kansas state and then either LSU uh, or UCLA. And then, I mean, we, we know on the women's side, uh, chalk holds more than the men's side. You have potential again in the final four against Ohio state, (laughs) Uh, who's sitting in the number two seed, uh, uh, so uh, or, or down in, in on their side of the bracket? So that again, we we've seen some games there, you know, with with Ohio State that they've had already. So it's a tough road for them, uh, but I I would probably trash this one too. Going back to cash it and trash it, cash it or trash it, because I just think South Carolina, while they almost look human, uh, if it wasn't for the Cardoso three pointer against Tennessee. Um, I just, I just don't think they're going to be stopped in this tournament. It is amazing though, to think about, you know, Dawn Staley in South Carolina, known commodity in that team and what she's built. One of the premier and preeminent programs of this decade of women's college basketball, certainly Kim Mulkey's LSU with Angel Reese and Haley Van Lith and these names that have been around and known Caitlin Clark in the same vein, but we've talked so much about all the freshmen. And when you look around at the one seeds, USC, Juju Watkins, we've talked a ton about, I don't feel like nationally we've talked as much about Madison Booker at Texas, who's one of the one seed teams was a semifinalist for the women's college player of the year, became the first freshman in the history of big 12 women's basketball to be named big 12 player of the year so you've got her to go along with Hannah Hidalgo that we've talked about in the ACC the sport has this perfect chance dad to pass the baton to a younger generation if they can go and accomplish in this tournament the way their predecessors had and considering everyone we talked about there is on the top line whether it's one or two seeds it's a great opportunity for what should be an incredibly compelling tournament where I've always said in March Madness you know we talk about the upsets in the first couple of rounds being the thing that feeds the beast the tournament where it truly feels like David has a chance to go out there and beat Goliath where the Cinderella story can make an actual run that we've seen time and time again you do also love having stakes and what feels like a final boss and I think because Caitlin Clark has been so singularly dominant in her career and because a team like South Carolina has an undefeated record you've got two teams on two different sides of the bracket that both carry that same weight where if someone manages to draw blood and God forbid knock them off it becomes a massive story for the sport and that kind of stuff I think is always great as you're trying to continue to build momentum around what's been an awesome product yeah listen I agree I think most people would love to see that matchup because we saw Iowa knock them out last year uh, in the final four this time if they met it would be for the national championship and and you know who who don't you know the people that don't care about uh Caitlin Clark ending her career with a national championship is anybody from South Carolina I mean, there, a lot of people obviously have their own agendas in this one, but that's what we'd like to see. As we've mentioned, the great storylines 
on the women's side as, as one of the greatest ever, and others, too, leave the game. I do think the game is in good hands with great storylines going forward. Yep, certainly uh, certainly in good hands there. So a lot to pay attention to. As we mentioned, we'll have plenty of experts on as the week goes along to talk about the best on both sides of this. Dad, some quick news around the rest of the world of college sports here. Notre Dame and the rest of the power conferences in the world of football agreed to the new playoff deal. The memorandum that understands and guarantees the field is going to have 12 teams until 2026 and beyond, but sources indicate that that 14-team field probably coming sooner than later. We've also got the different financials and we mentioned before dad i'm curious to see if this has ripple effects elsewhere in the sport this new system gives heavily weighted favor to the big 10 and the sec getting more teams automatically potentially into the dance a bigger right. payout certainly for getting there and if that's going to have ripple effects like we talked about around the world of college basketball in how that's structured because we're already seeing similarities dad in college basketball to the opt-outs that we've seen in college football where we've seen players opting out of bowl games here but now you've got teams like St. John's, like Providence and others, Oklahoma, I believe, who were snubbed from the NCAA tournament and have declined bids to things like the NIT, were all of a sudden, because today, I don't know if people know this as readily, the transfer portal for college basketball opens today in a way that a lot of people around the yep. sport see as tremendously unfair to the teams involved and the players who have to try and make this decision with more teams having a bite at the championship apple than in football, Dad. So it's an incredibly complicated time for college sports, but college basketball I don't think has gotten talked about nearly as much as they enter the fray on what we've seen happen with football over the years. I, I agree. I mean, it is amazing to think that the portal opened today and we, we, we start the tournament on Thursday. <laughs> With the first round, that does seem very, very wild. And like you said, teams turning down the NIT now. So where where is this going to go? This, I mean, we haven't even played a year yet with 12 teams. We're already talking about going to 14 teams. So the two things of interest to me, number one is Notre Dame because that's our school. And the fact that, that we don't know the layout yet of the 14 teams, but we do believe as part of it, Notre Dame will get an automatic bid if they are ranked 14 or higher, which we think is one of the big reasons that would still keep them independent as so many people want them to join a conference. And the other is, you mentioned it, the money that's going to change, the, the better teams, the bigger teams getting more money. But they said two years into when that system starting in 2026 or like 2028, they'll reassess. And if more teams, other teams are making in, they may change the money structure a bit. We'll wait and see. A lot of structural change. A lot of people wondering and worrying if that'll come to March Madness. We'll put those worries aside and coming up next, crown a champion of our own as we look ahead to the all-weekend team here on Gojo and Gold.
We are back here in Gojo and Golik with a very, very important update in the Fry 4 bracket. McDonald's Fry is just running away with it right now. 43%, almost 1,800 votes. 22 hours left, though, people. So at Gojo and Golik on Twitter, make sure to cast your vote. Five Guys Fries, guys, 24.6. It is in second, but it looks like McDanks is uh, going to be the favorite in this one. Yeah, blue chipper. That's no surprise. McDonald's, I probably should have. I, I yeah. saw a lot of yeah. the groundswell support for checkers and rallies, and I certainly think they deserve their day in court. But uh, McDonald's has been around and been doing this for a long time, and it's hard to overcome all yeah. that inertia. So not overly surprised on that one, Dad. Even if selfishly, I think curly fry is the best cut of fry that exists on this planet. I love Arby's version of those curly fries, but unfortunately it doesn't look like they're going to make it through to the next round. Yeah, I, I love the curly fries as well, in all honesty. But the 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 royalty of the McDonald's fries has just been for so long. I just think that people almost absentmindedly just pick them ahead of everybody else when I actually do think there are better fries out there. I actually voted for Arby's uh, in this one. But I they're, they're, listen, there's plenty of time. Um, we can see a change at the top. I think it'll be tough to knock out McDonald's. But, hey, every vote counts. So get in there and vote at Gojo and Golik. Yep. About 1,800 votes in right now. And again, the winner of this becomes the one seed of the sides region of a bracket that includes mains, includes drinks, it includes desserts, all in the name of crowning one true champion. But, Dad, before we crown that champion, we got to get through our all-weekend team here. The best of the rest from a very busy, crowded weekend in the world of sports. We'll go honorable mention second and third team here, or second and first team here. Excuse me. I'll start it off to that honorable mention from this weekend. I'll go to the Jets. While so many of the headlines recently have been around Aaron Rodgers and would he or wouldn't he be on a VP ticket that we found out now he won't be a part of and some other uh, certainly grosser conspiracy theories that got linked to him for a bit, the good news is the rest of the team actually might be coming together around him. The Jets managed to sign Tyron Smith, the now former Dallas Cowboys tackle, to what's ostensibly a one-year $6.5 million deal. It's got tons of incentives in it, up to $20 million potentially if things go well for him. But you look at that line now. They brought John Simpson in from the Baltimore Ravens. Elijah Vera Tucker can stay in at guard. Morgan Moses at tackle. That was the priority this offseason, Dad. And Tyron Smith was the name once we found out he wasn't going to be back with the Dallas Cowboys. So I still think massive mistake stake for the Dallas Cowboys you're gonna need some competent backup there because Tyron Smith at this stage in his career hasn't yeah. shown that he can stay healthy and available for the entire season but at the top end when he's good it still really hums with him at that spot I think this is what happens when you have a quarterback like Aaron Rodgers kind of when Tom Brady went to Tampa Bay Aaron Rodgers going to the Jets is you you push all your chips in for each single year single year I can't even say the word for each year Right, So last year they obviously did it four plays and it was over. So you do it again this year because this is a kind of a hope and pray, isn't it, Mike? I mean, he's dealt with – he's a walk-in Hall of Famer, but he has dealt with injuries and he has missed time. So one of the biggest things I agree with you here is you you got to have a competent backup because, man, he looks the part. He is unbelievable when he is on, but he has missed time with an injury. So that, that's my only worry. But I get it from the Jets' standpoint of, you, as I said, you throw all those chips into the middle here uh, to build around Aaron Rodgers. Yep, no doubt. Who's your, all, who's all right, your so honorable mention, with, Dad? <clears throat> yep, my honorable mention, I'm going to go to Wemby. Go to the NBA and go Victor Wembenyama. They beat the Nets 122-115. Uh, he had 33 points, 15 rebounds, 7 blocks, and 7 assists. Go ahead, dunk, and a big block at the end of the game. He's the fourth player in NBA history to finish a game with at least 30 points, 15 rebounds, seven, uh, seven uh, blocks, and, and seven assists since blocks became an official stat in 1973. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Charles Barkley, Joel Embiid. So his rookie year, he's going to be the rookie of the year. In his rookie year, he's already put himself uh, in, in a, a list with those three guys. Pretty impressive what he's doing. So as we have talked about with him and that team building over time, man, he is fun to watch. And if they ever become a team that's also a threat, you know, in the Western Conference, even more fun. But he is he is a unicorn. Yeah, that day coming sooner than later, the guy is too undeniably good, and that beacon is going to go out to other players that want to get in there and play with the seven foot four French phenom 
Uh, all weekend, second team, Dad. I'm going to go to lacrosse. We're getting to the springtime there. College lacrosse outside of football is my favorite sport by far. And Notre Dame lacrosse back in position to defend their national championship. They got off the schneid last year and won the first one in their program's history. Now the number two ranked team in the country behind Army. But the story this weekend was them putting it on Michigan enthusiastically. They beat the Wolverines in South Bend 19-9. to And, Dad, this comes after an offseason where Michigan head coach Kevin Conry made some waves and ruffled some feathers in ACC country when he was talking glowingly about the Big Ten and was trying to pump them up saying we're the best conference in lacrosse you've got Maryland who's been a national championship recently John Hopkins who's an all-time program but he said we don't play pretty boy lacrosse this is a league with six four gorillas playing defense and a lot of the folks over in ACC country took that some type of way I'd imagine including Notre Dame who went out there and made him eat his words and made his team eat a whole lot of goals in South Bend Listen, the best way to get back at something like that is to do exactly what they did. You don't want to talk. You don't want to say anything. You just want to go out there and dominate and embarrass them, which is exactly what Notre Dame did. So that's the best way to, to shut somebody up who wants to, you know, flap their gums a little bit about, you know, their ball as opposed to other uh, conferences' ball is to go smoke it by 10. So congrats to Notre Dame lacrosse. Let's see if they can repeat as national championships. And let's stick with Notre Dame and national champions um, uh, for my uh, runner-up. Uh, that is going to be Notre Dame Gaelic football. How about them winning the national championship? They won a couple now, took a couple of silvers in hurling. As I found out, Mike, when I went to Ireland to watch uh, Notre Dame play Navy in football, I found out that, that hurling – Gaelic football and hurling are the two most popular sports in Ireland, and they're amateur sports. They're not even pro sports. Gaelic football is, is closer to rugby. It's a round ball. There's some different rules than rugby. And hurling is a stick and ball, which I don't even know how to describe it. Watch, watch some, some video of it. It is an amazing you know, hand-eye coordination sport. Uh, but it, extremely fun to watch when I was out there. But congrats to Notre Dame racking up another national championship. Remember, we are a fencing school, uh, so we have the fencing titles. But now Gaelic football have a couple of national championships there and a couple of runner-ups in hurling as well. So good day for the Irish. A three-peat in national championships for Notre Dame's Gaelic football squad. So joining the fencing team in that distinction there on campus. Dad, all weekend, first team for me. Got to give it up for Kyrie Irving, the hook shot game winner to seal it for the Dallas Mavericks against the Denver Nuggets there. Uh, the exact distance, according to Spectrum on that, was 20.1 feet is the second longest hook shot made by any player this season, according to NBA.com play-by-play data. Good one for Kyrie Irving, who's sort of been out of the spotlight now. Now that he's done espousing conspiracy theories, sitting there next to Luka Doncic, who's an MVP candidate, but shows up big time for a team that's now won five of their last six. Yeah, very, very impressive. Uh, that that What a shot that was. I mean, a lefty over to the Joker was pretty damn impressive. Uh, my first team is going to be Scotty Scheffler and what he did at the Players. In 49 years of the Players' Championship, there had never been a back-to-back -back winner. Scotty Scheffler is that guy right now. He was sitting at 20 under, and he was done before guys that were chasing him were done. So you had Xander Shoffley, Brian Harmon, and Wyndham Clark all one stroke behind going into the 18th hole. You figured one of them, one of them would be able to birdie and force a playoff. Nobody did. All neither None of them hit, got a birdie. None of them tied uh, uh, Scheffler, who was out on the range practicing his putting, getting ready to, to pull the driver out in the irons a little bit, and then found out that he had won. So, what, what I mean, he's the number one player in the world, just uh, an incredible player. As we said, back to back players' championships for the first time in their 49 years. So, he wins the weekend for me. An absolute gut punch of a lip a lip out from L Wyndham Clark on oh 18 my gosh. that could have forced yeah. the playoff there. A brutal finish, but like you said, we asked about stars stepping up, and Scotty Scheffler takes the mantle, deciding to become the first player to repeat here. He had gone back-to-back -back weekends and back-to-back -back tournaments with a win there, so a lot of great momentum, a lot of great performances for the weekend that we saw. Coming up next, we bring it home with this, that, and the third, including major news at our alma mater. Coming up next.
All right, time to finish off the show the way we always do. This, that, and the third. Three quick stories. Send you into the rest of your day. As always, download, subscribe, rate, review us. Leave us a five-star rating. Watch us. Check us out live Monday through Friday from 8 to 10 a.m. Eastern on DraftKings Network. Catch us, the best of Gojo and Golik, for an hour on VSIM, wherever you get them on the radio. That's noon to 1 p.m. Eastern. And if you miss us or any of our great guests, big shout-out to number two seed, Notre Dame women's basketball head coach Neil Ivey joined us to talk about their season so far. If you missed it, check it out wherever you get your podcast or available right here on YouTube as soon as we get done. Guys, let's get to this, that, and the third, and let's talk about this. Uh, Dad, we mentioned Notre Dame a bunch during this show. Cool legacy moment for Notre Dame over the weekend, though. A name everyone will be familiar with. Wide receiver Jerome Bettis Jr. has committed to the University of Notre Dame in the class of 2025. The 6'2", 190-pound uh, prospect, uh, obviously the son of Hall of Famer, incredible Notre Dame running back, longtime Pittsburgh Steelers running back, Jerome Bettis. And Daddy put out a great video talking about his commitments, that he started his career wearing 36 and playing running back like his dad. He ended up going his own way, wearing number four here. Not sure what he'll wear at Notre Dame, but making that move to wide receiver, but going to South Bend to continue on a legacy, you know, something that I guess a couple of people in this chat know a little something about. So good luck, man. Uh, you yeah. know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting path trying to go to a place that's that established with your family and carve out a niche, especially with that last name yeah listen like i told you and your brother jake i think you were on a visit to florida at that point when urban meyer was coaching florida and jake was down there as well and i was down there with you guys when i'd said you know don't go to notre dame for any other reason you know not because you know me and your mother you know who went to saint mary's and so many of my brothers went there you got to go where you want to go where you feel comfortable going and i'm sure Jerome said the same thing to his son, who was recruited by Texas A&M, Duke, and Ole Miss, is you want to, you know, forge your own path and make, you know, the reasons be for yourself, not uh, for your parents. And you knew it, it wasn't going to be a running back. 6'2", 195, wasn't going to be a running back with a big bruising running back like his dad, that's for sure. So very cool. And there's others as well. Brian Erlacher's son is going to Notre Dame. I think Plexico Burris' son is also going to Notre Dame. So we have some, well, some, uh, Bryant, some NFL royalty. Bryant Young also, the former great Notre Dame defensive lineman. Right. We talked to him in the playoff game uh, between Green Bay and San Francisco. Just dropped his son off. He's a five-star D-end early enrollee for them. So, yeah, we've arrived at that point now where it's the fathers dropping their very yeah. famous last-named <laughs> sons off to try and do their thing. So having B.Y.'s <laughs> kid and Jerome Bettis's kid on the same team in South Bend, going to be pretty interesting yeah. in the coming years there. And it's, it's, it's a cool moment. It's something I know that was really special for our family, for me, my brother, and my sister to all get yep. to go do this at a place that was so special to you guys and so it, it is a unique opportunity there's a lot of noise that comes with it too that I'm sure he's going to hear throughout this process comparison is always sitting around every corner but at the end of the day you got an opportunity to make it your own so rooting for the young man and, and certainly congratulations to him and the whole Bettis family very very cool moment for them let's take a hard pivot Claudia and go to that and talk about a bunch of Russian dudes playing really bad basketball yeah, I saw this clip over the weekend, and I said this needs to go on the show because it's very Gojo and Golik-esque. So apparently this is a sport played in Russia, most popularly. It's called rug ball. It's a mix between basketball and wrestling, but really dangerous wrestling. It is played at a professional level, 22-team league, but it looks like you have to take your shirt off <laughs> to suplex someone. So basically, there's a ball, you're trying to get it in the net, but from the video, you have to take your shirt off in order to flip someone and almost break their neck. If you're not watching, you need to go watch these videos. It looks absolutely ridiculous, but apparently, Gojo, it's a professional sport. I, I love that, that that you clearly the the shirt takeoff thing. I was a little confused out at first, but seeing it in action, yeah. it's clearly to give the defense because you're doing it to go blindside someone underneath the rim, and so it's kind of got to be that signal to everyone that oh, this is coming. Where maybe, Dad, if out of the corner of your eye you catch a dude all of a sudden ditching the tarp, you can now ready yourself to try and get <laughs> yeah. suplex because the end result of that, right? I'm surprised there aren't more like compound fractures and guys full on breaking their neck in this. Yeah. It's great wrestling. Oh my gosh, they got confetti yeah, falling and, right and now. And confetti. You, you can't. <laughs> it, it, it is just amazing. The ability to take your shirt off while you're starting the suplex is very, very impressive. 
Mike, this is your, me and you, this is our kind of basketball. Jake was a basketball. Jake could play basketball. Jake was a really good athlete. He played, he played basketball. He played, you know, between the high school and AAU and all that, all that fun stuff. And, and obviously, uh, uh, he, he played it. We didn't. I know you did, but I didn't. I wrestled. I think this, Mike, would more fit our game where we always say we could use our six fouls really well in basketball. Well, hell, if you're allowed to do this, then this is our game. You know, because we're not going to be the scorers. We're going to be the suplex ors, not the suplex ease, hopefully. This was a collection of some of the brokest jump shots I've ever seen in my life. Like, this <laughs> truly is basketball for people that can't play basketball. And as Claudia pointed out before, it's definitely, like, it's called rug ball, but it's definitely not rugby. No. None of this resembles rugby. No. This is basically no. just like WWE and basketball mixed together, which, yeah, you know, yep. good on them. You'll, you'll be out for several games if you try to do a tackle like that in rugby. Maybe this season. But I don't yeah, even no, know God, how that's God help you. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know what the rules are like in Russia, but apparently when it comes to sports, there just really aren't any. Except for taking your I shirt think off. If there's one thing we've learned about Russia is like they're <clears throat> willing to kind of like, I, like, I'm surprised there's not a bear on the court. That would seem like the most <laughs> Russian outcome of this is to just, okay, we've got this sport that's already a chaotic blend of some other ones here. Yeah. Now we introduce bear and maybe vodka. Mm-hmm. Which I'm sure is so, and, and I'll say I was on the re I was on the receiving end of that move when I was in high school. Um, a a Russian wrestling team traveled to the United States, and my brother Bob, who was obviously not in high school at that point, was a wrestler as well. And we had to, we wrestled this Russian team, uh, a mixture of supposedly all star wrestlers, and it was Greco Roman all upper body, and there were two heavier weight classes and me and my brother Bob we tried to pick the person from Russia who was a better wrestler and Bob would wrestle him because Bob was a better wrestler he was older than me he was a better wrestler than me and we got it wrong Bob had the guy that was not good I had the guy that was really good this dude I was losing in this Greco-Roman match by so many points I don't even know what happened to me and he suplexed me one at one point luckily I turned my shoulders enough to not get stuck because as soon as your back hits the mat like that it's over I was able to turn it a little bit but yeah I felt that I felt what it's like to go flying through the air, and it was not fun at all. God, so dangerous. You, you, were, you were ahead of your time. You could have been ready for some rug ball. We saw you yeah. have a clearly broken jumper based on your all-star appearance at the NBA Celebrity <laughs> Game, so <laughs> it would have worked very, very well in this <laughs> particular setting. Uh, speaking of misfires, and you heard one a little bit in this segment here, Claudia, let's get to the third, one of the best calls from Conference Championship Weekend in college basketball. Yeah, Kevin Harlan was ready for this already mid-tourney form. Uh, so the Atlantic 10 title game was on Sunday between Duquesne and VCU. There was 18 minutes left in the game, yet confetti came falling from the ceiling. And CBS Sports' Kevin Harlan was on the call. Here's what he had to say. He got excited. Oh my gosh, they've got confetti falling right now. Confetti is falling on the floor. They're going to have to stop playing. We can't see our notes. The players can't work on this court. Confetti is everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody well, uh, hit the wrong button. Well, Kevin, to be honest with you, there's not a lot of this confetti that made it on the court. Most of it fell on us. That was an early ejection right there. And, and they're gonna have to, are they going to have to reload it now for the winner? I mean, my goodness, it's... Uh, <laughs> well, your winner might have to go uh, confetti-less, at least in this part of the... Uh, well, Dan, you're, you're, you're not going to go confetti-less. You're collecting it like you're going to bring it home to your grandkids or something. Well, I mean, you know, my grandkids would probably it's, it's, like this. It's confetti. Somebody lost their job that day, Georgia. <laughs> I'm kidding. I don't know. Oh, I can't imagine <laughs> the panic that was going on for oh. the person that accidentally grazed yes. that button. And create, you know what? Thankfully, created a great moment because you've got Kevin Harlan there. And when you've got Kevin Harlan there, you've yep. always got a chance because that dude meets the moment as well or better than anyone in sports. <laughs> Kevin saved it. Kevin saved yeah. it with like he normally does with great, you know, out of the box type of calls. And there, there he was to save the day yet again. A guy's drunk. It's incredible stuff, as always, from him. Congrats to Duquesne, by the way. Makes the NCAA tournament for the first time in 47 years. You can get more great tournament info from the Sweat Bracket Breakdown Special tonight from 6 to 9 p.m. Eastern on DKN. And make sure you go and vote on our Fry 4 at Gojo and Golik. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you guys tomorrow.